morning, Chad. Love it. Check one, two. Good morning, good morning. Based on last week, it looks like there's a lot of people feeling the spring blues. <laughs> Easter hangover. <laughs> We're gonna worship together. We're so happy you're here. Would you please stand with us as we sing our first song?
There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation, Jesus. There is a light that overwhelms the darkness. There is a kingdom that forever reigns. There is freedom from the chains that bind us. Good morning, everyone. I invite you to take your seats, uh, share a little bit of welcome with you. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at Faith Journey, and I want to welcome you all. If this is your first time, or if this has if many times you've been here, we are certainly glad that you are worshiping with us today. Um, if you are uh, willing, we'd like to have you let us know that you were here by filling out the tear-off on page three of your worship bulletin. You can give that to one of the ushers or put it in the offering plate. Uh, when it comes by. That's simply a way that we, were know, we know you were here with us. And uh, it's a great way for you to share any information you'd like to share with us. Uh, name, address change, uh, anything like that. Changing contact information or prayer requests. We pray over all of the prayer requests every Tuesday in our staff meeting. And if you have a prayer request that you would like us to share and be in prayer with you about, it could be something 
uh, that's coming up, a surgery or something, or it could be something that you want to be thankful for, um, guidance or something like that, anything at all. We'd love to pray with you and join you uh, in that prayer. Uh, Carl's going to share some ministry highlights with us uh, in, uh, right now, and then I have another announcement to share with you as well. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There will be a congregational meeting today, April 28th, at 12, 15 p.m. at the downtown campus in the Fellowship Hall. There will be a very special announcement made at this meeting, and you will not want to miss it. <laughs> Confirmation Sunday is next Sunday, May 5th, at 2 p.m. at the downtown campus. Come support those youth, those young men and women as they affirm the promises of their baptism. The community impact team fostering hope drive begins today. Suggested bathroom items include towels, bath towels, hand towels, washcloths, shower curtains with rings, bath mats, and rugs, shower organizers, trash cans, plungers, toilet brushes, toilet paper, soap dispenser, toothbrush holders, hampers, and storage boxes. Yeah. Items can be brought to either campuses and put in the drop-off boxes. Collection dates are April 20th through May 19th. Those are our highlights for today. You can also always check, check out the video screens for the announcement videos and the website for all of the happenings here at Faith Journey. You're the first person that I heard get applause for, <laughs> for announcements. Uh, this time, I'm going to invite Annette Kreft forward. Uh, you saw on our announcements uh, this uh, uh, collection of bathroom items, and that is a very special emphasis uh, that our community impact team, which was formerly known as Social Ministry, is sponsoring. And so Annette's going to introduce a guest to us who's going to tell us a little bit about PATH and about what they are doing with all these cool bathroom items that they will be collecting. Good morning. Good morning. Well. <laughs> um, this quarter, our community impact team is focusing on the PATH organization and collecting those bathroom items that Mike mentioned for individuals going into independent living. At this time, I would like to introduce Liz, who is an independent living coordinator from PATH, to explain their program. Thank you, Liz. Hello. Um, like like they said, I am from PATH. Um, I work as an independent living coordinator. I am one out of the seven ones out of North Dakota. Um, you may recognize our agency best for providing treatment foster care. You may be seeing our billboards up as you're driving. Um, but PATH also uh, um, offers a lot of other programs. Um, and I'm here to today to talk about the independent living program, which I work for. Um, I currently work with um, youth that are in foster care or youth that have aged out of foster care, ages 16 to 23. Um, this program helps youth educate um, teens by balancing checkbooks, budgeting, eating healthy, building healthy, lifesty healthy lifestyles, um, and making smart decisions. Um, in the last year, we worked with 468 youth in North Dakota. Um, as these youth near the age of 18, we assist youth um, working on their goals, whether it be college, a trade school, joining the workforce. Um, our goal is to help them apply for jobs, find safe housing, and transition into adulthood successfully. I always tell my youth that I want to be their biggest cheerleader, um, and my role is very different from a social worker. I'm there to help them work on their goals and what they want to do. Usually social workers are telling them what to do and what their plans should be. So um, we always try to support them in whatever um, is going on in their world and what they want to do. Um, youth that are turning age 18 in foster care do have the opportunity to sign themselves back into foster care. 
um, to the age of 21. Um, some choose to do this because they, they, they desire the support of the foster family, um, but others choose to live independently. Um, some would think that this is an easy decision to sign themselves back into foster care, um, which isn't always the best thing for them because they always think that they're being told what to do and their decisions are not theirs. Um, so then they choose to live independently. Um, and then we as coordinators um, try to give them as much support as we can. Um, if I could just des describe our teens and young adults in one word, I would use the word resilient. These youth enter foster care at no fault of their own, bringing in the effect of traumatic experiences with them. They come from a home with domestic violence, drug abuse, um, unrelated mental illnesses, physical, emotional abuse, or neglect. And oftentimes we learn that the parents grew up in similar situations um, and it's a generational thing. And so we wanna see this stop with our teens and help them and support them any way we can. Um, we wanna see our young people succeed and cheer them on, um, making healthy decisions that will change their life. So we're very thankful for all the donations that your church is willing to bring, um, all these things that um, the donations, the bathroom items, when they're getting out on their own, when they turn 18, they don't really have the support of a mom or a dad or grandma and grandpa to help them with those things. I know when I was um, turning 18, my mom helped me huge um, in, those, in those things. So we try to help our youth by setting them up in apartments or dorms um, with all those items that were listed earlier. Um, so if you want more information or have any questions, um, I'll be, there's a booth in the back. Um, we can chat afterwards. Um, but thank you so much for your time this morning. I know a lot of our youth on our caseload will benefit from the generous gener donations. Um, thank you. Now everyone knows that the Sunday after Easter is, uh, stay here. Everyone knows that the Sunday after Easter is always low attendance Sunday. And that had nothing to do with inviting PATH here with us today. <laughs> but here's what we have to do. We have to seek out those folks that we know usually attend and we have to share this with them because they're gonna show up next week and just see a display and not know what we're doing or why we're doing it or how important it is. And uh, I remember when I went off to graduate school, the first time I was really gonna live on my own, I remember how thankful I was. I had a mom and dad who could say, now you gotta remember to buy toilet paper. <laughs> you gotta remember to have these kinds of things. And having that support system and having, you know, them there with, and these, these kids just don't have that. I mean, they are, they are entering out into the real world with, a, with a, a, a large load on them that a lot of us never experienced. And so by being able to collect those uh, items for them and have them and just simple stuff like a toilet bowl brush or uh, you know, uh, the, the stuff you saw on the screen is such a great gift to give these folks uh, a little a uh, hand up, not a handout. So I really encourage you to share this with folks that you know come to this service when you see them. Uh, and when you uh, go by Target and you're getting your stuff, pick up a, a couple extra toilet brush, uh, toilet brushes. You know, it'll make a good conversation with the checkout person why you need six of them. You know, you can just say, hey, you know, whatever. So, Annette. Can I also plug that Coles is having their big, like, house stuff sale this week. So you get towels for $2.99, just saying. All right, our collection for these items will run today through May 19th. Um, we thought that would be a good time to end so we can get some of these items out to these kids as they start to graduate and move on. We have the whole list of items which we are collecting at the table in the Northex, which is also the drop-off area. We'll have boxes out there indicated for that. If you wish to donate money instead, um, please indicate on your check memo or on the envelope community impact to make sure it goes to that particular project. If you have any questions, uh, we'll also be out in the Narthex after the service today. Thank you so much and we appreciate everything you do. We'd like to just ask if there are any other announcements. Uh, Kim? leg of the marathon at 6.45 a.m. <laughs> and it's only a few hours where you direct traffic and because we're the first leg there's not a lot of traffic to direct so you just got to stand there and watch the runners run by. And here's what you need to do. Yay! And it's to benefit three organizations which are near and dear to Eric's heart. Um, tuberous sclerosis <laughs> alliance, which everyone probably knows Eric has tuberous sclerosis, 
The other is the Asperger um, Foundation here in Fargo and Autism Foundation. And the third one is Special Olympics. So if you um, would like, to, we would appreciate it if we get 50 people to volunteer on uh, that marathon, then we, each of these organizations will get $500. And we're going to make that signing up really easy by putting a link on our homepage that'll say Fargo Marathon Sign Up. When you click on that, it'll take you right to the volunteer page and you can sign up there and then uh, uh, Kim will know uh, that we have enough volunteers. So thank you, Kim. Let's take a five minute break and get some goodies, warm up our coffee, say hi to our neighbors, uh, introduce ourselves and we'll be back in five minutes.
So usually our, uh, our our band leader announces this part of the service, but since she's oh there she is, hi. At this time in our worship service, we are going to collect our tithes and our offerings. Uh, these are the ways in which we support the ministry of our church, and um, we collect a what we call a noisy offering, which is in these uh, containers right in the middle. That's a special offering for our three children in uh, Tanzania who uh, we support. And so I invite you to bring those up and uh, clank those in the noisy offering containers and our ushers will come by uh, with our uh, offering baskets to collect uh, the other offering that supports our ministry. <laughs>
Thank you for all the gifts, time, and talent that people bring to this space. As we celebrate after the wonderful time of Easter, that we live together free because of the sacrifice you made on the cross. In your name we pray. Good news of Jesus, according to John chapter 20, verse 19 through 31. If you would like to follow along, you may do so by turning to page 3833. Three. Scripture is at the center of worship, and we always encourage you to bring your own Bible. Mark it up. Take notes in it. If you don't have one of your own, please take one of ours as our gift to you. John, the 20th chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When, you have, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his in of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the marks of the nails and my hand is in his side i i will not believe a week later his disciples were again in the house and thomas was with them Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered, My Lord, my God, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But though, but these are written so that you 
may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the good news of Jesus. It's always kind of disappointing the Sunday after Easter that this particular text gets assigned. Now, obviously, it fits in the timeline. You know, Jesus is, uh, um, it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's later that day on Resurrection Sunday, so it fits the timeline that this text should happen, but as I said before, today is always considered in the church low attendance Sunday. People kind of get their two-week dose of church on Easter Sunday and they kind of take this one off. And so relatively little is known about this particular story. Um, of course, we know about Thomas and we know that even though in the Bible he's called Thomas the twin, we have renamed him Doubting Thomas because he's the only one who has the guts to say, wait a minute, I'm not so sure about this. Um, Thomas is really more of a brave person because he was out and about on Sunday. Who knows what he was doing? He may have been getting food. He may have been doing anything else. And we're told that the other disciples are locked in this room because they're afraid. They're afraid they're going to be identified as followers of Jesus. Of course, the story says they're afraid of the Jews. I think they were afraid of everybody. I don't think it was just limited to the Jewish folk. I think they were very afraid of the Romans. Remember, Jesus was killed by the Roman government because one of the things he was doing was he was inciting insurrection. He was claiming to be the king, and Rome doesn't like that. Rome wants peace. Rome wants quiet. Rome wants you to pay your taxes and keep your mouth shut and just go on with your daily business and don't raise a ruckus. And, of course, Jesus was raising a ruckus. And so he got crucified for that. And anyone who is a follower of his would meet a, a similar fate. But Thomas is out and about. Thomas is doing whatever he needed to do, uh, getting food, do, doing the normal routine. He's the one who's willing to go out and be identified. And so he happens to miss Jesus. And we, we hone in on his statements, unless I see, unless I touch Unless I put my hand into his side, which gives me the heebie-jeebies, I won't believe. I can't believe. He's unwilling to trust his own eyes, which is probably not a bad thing to, to, uh, to have, is that sometimes our eyes can fool us. Sometimes we see what we want to see. Sometimes we're so desperate to see something, to feel something, or even to hear something, that we will see it, we will feel it, we will hear it. I went to a conference once, uh, it was actually, this is when I was in seminary, and it was a conference on skepticism. A comp I, I, I didn't think it was gonna be anything, you know. <laughs> but it was part of one of our classes we had to take, and it was, a, it was a conference led by this person who made their living debunking things. So you know how sometimes people see the Virgin Mary in a tortilla chip, or Jesus appears in a piece of toast or somebody has a miraculous whatever and this person would then go in and kind of see if there's any other cause or any other way that that could be explained other than divine intervention. And, and many times this person discovered, uh, yes, in fact, uh, that is not Jesus showing up in a pane of glass, but it's because there's a sprinkler there. And if you go around the back side of the building where there's another sprinkler, you'll see another image of Jesus. It just happens to be as the spray goes off. And the professor wanted us to go to this skeptics conference to, 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 to have a little bit of, of, of objectivity because we want to see things. We want to feel things. We want so desperately sometimes that we're willing to do just about anything if we can see, feel, experience what we what we want. 
One of the things that one of the presenters said at this conference was there's a reason why so often we will see a face in a piece of toast, a tortilla chip, on a window, on the moon, you know? Uh, the, the way certain, uh, if you take a picture of the, of the sun setting and all of a sudden there's an image there, he said there's a reason why we as humans can pick those things out because we are programmed to see faces. What do we look at when we look at somebody? We look at their face. We identify certain features that set people we know apart from people we don't know. We are facial recognition beings. That's what we do. And so he talked about how many times people will take a picture of something, something totally uh, you know, innocuous, something totally nondescript, and all of a sudden they will start picking things out and seeing Jesus or seeing the Virgin Mother or seeing something else and, and, and wanting to feel like that is a, a, a miracle. And Thomas is the one. Thomas is the one who says, I'm not so sure. I think we give Thomas a bad rap. I think he says, I want to have that real experience with Jesus that I've had before. I want to confirm an emotion. I want to confirm that Jesus is real and I can't just rely on what you folks are telling me because quite frankly, we're all a little bit traumatized by what's happened. So I just want to give Thomas the benefit of the doubt. I, want to, I don't want to think that, that just because he's the one who, who probably says what other people think that he gets the benefit. Because Jesus then appears to him and, and invites him to, to take that deeper step, to, to, to come a little bit closer. Jesus accommodates Thomas's needs. He doesn't chastise him. He doesn't cast him out of the group for his unbelief or his doubting. But he invites him to step even closer. He invites him into a deeper relationship. He's the only one that we know of that gets to touch Jesus. He's the only one who's invited forward and says, here, put your finger there. See that it's real. The other 10 don't get to do that. Only Thomas gets that real intimate experience with Jesus in that way. In the midst of his doubt or in the midst of his questioning or in the midst of his speculation, his skepticism, whatever you want to call it, Jesus appears to him, <clears throat> appears to him and invites him closer. It seems to me that this is an indicator, or at least a, 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 a it gives us permission to be a little bit skeptical sometimes, to have doubts. Doubt is not the antithesis of faith. Doubt is not the, other, is not the opposite pole of faith. I believe doubt is part of faith. Doubt is part of the faith process. It's okay for us to ask questions. It's okay for us to be just a little bit skeptical. It's okay for us not to trust our own emotional feelings. It's okay for us because in that, Jesus, God, is inviting us closer. Bring your questions, says God. Bring your doubts, bring your skepticism, bring them to me, bring them to the altar, just in the very same way that we bring every other aspect of our life to God. We don't have to hide that part. We don't have to hide anything from God. We can bring everything. That's the kind of overwhelmingly open relationship that God wants to have with us. It is so unlike anything else that we ever have experienced in our lives. You know, Jesus says to the disciples, peace be with you. My peace I give to you. And Jesus says other places that he doesn't give peace the way the world gives it. That his peace is different. His love is different. Because in the world, and then by the world I mean outside of this realm of faith and, and, and community that we exist in, when we're out dealing in the, in the world of, of traffic lights and car crashes and um, horrible attacks on worshiping communities, there was just another one in Palo Alto, uh, uh, 
uh, some nut job went and shut up a synagogue and uh, I think one person lost, I mean, in that world, in that, in that real world we live in, you know, peace, love, all of the things that we share with one another at their very best are shared with a certain amount of conditionality. You know, there's a, there, there's a, there's a certain bit of, you know, uh, quid pro quo when we want to share uh, uh, love and acceptance and all those good things with one another. There's always something, something that we kind of expect back. You know, even when we give a gift, even when, you know, assume this is a wonderful gift and I give it to somebody and I say, this is a wonderful gift and, and this gift this gift represents, you know, our relationship and, and, and the, the love and affection I have for you. And I, and I, I saved for months and months and years to, to buy this very precious thing and I give it to that person. And the minute I give it to that person, it's no longer mine, right? I'm releasing it. But how many times do we then, where's my gift that I gave you? What are you doing with it? Have you done what I want you to do with it? And so we're conditioned to have kind of this give and take relationship. Even, even, even at our best, we do that. And Jesus says, I don't give you what I have the way other people do. Whatever it is, peace is one of the words that sticks out in the verses that were read. He says it again and again. My peace I give to you. Another word that sticks out for me in this, in this verse was the word life. The life that Jesus gives us is unlike the life we get from anyone else or anything else because it comes completely, it comes totally, it comes overwhelmingly, and it comes freely. One of the wonderful things about the Greek language and also one of the most annoying things about the Greek language is that they have many words for one thing. Kind of like in, 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 the, in the native tongue of the Eskimo people, they have like 65 different words for the word snow because it depends on what kind of snow you're talking about, right? For us English speakers, you're Northern Europeans, there's snow, and if it's not snow, it's something else. It's slush or whatever, right? Well, not so with the native speakers because they have an intimate relationship with snow, so they have many different words for it. Well, Greek was the same way. Um, we put modifiers in front of our words to, to tell us a little bit more about it. They just change the word. And so the word there that says life, when Jesus says, uh, when, when John says that Jesus came to believe and that you would have life, he's not talking about life, you know, heartbeat, thump, thump, breathing in, out, go to work, come home, eat dinner, go to bed, get up, eat breakfast, go to work. He's not talking about that kind of life. That word, and I... I I just can't pronounce it right, and I don't want to. This is being filmed, and I know that one of my seminary colleagues is going to see this and say, you didn't say that right. It's Z-O-E, Zoe. That's a very specific kind of life that is being talked about. It's not just any kind of life. It is eternal life. It is all-encompassing life. It is the life that we can only get from a deep and intimate relationship with Jesus. And it comes to us and it comes unconditionally. You, you hear that even though Jesus says to Thomas, you know, blessed, you know, you, 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 uh, you believe because you saw. But I want to tell you, blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. Even though he says that, and that was kind of a sharp little jab, I think, at maybe Thomas. He still gives them all life. There's no conditionality. It isn't, well... Thomas, you didn't measure up. You didn't, you, know, you didn't believe like the rest of your buds, so they get the life and you don't. It's just given. The empty cross, given. The empty tomb, it's given. New life is given. Peace is given. Whether we're in a state of doubt and questioning or whether we are not, it's just given given and that's the one thing that we have that makes our faith community so awesome and it's the one thing that people just can't get their heads around one of the things that keeps people out of the church the number one thing is the belief that Christians are judgmental that's number one the number two thing is that people believe Christians are uh, hypocritical 
And number three is people believe it's just too good to be true. There's gotta be a, there's gotta be a catch. They cannot accept the unconditionality of God's love for them because we just don't experience that anywhere in our lives. We don't experience that kind of total, unrelenting, unconditionality that God is just going to love you. But what if I do the wrong thing? God's still going to love you. Well, what if I can't believe? God still loves you. But what if I don't go to church? God still loves you. So I don't have to do anything? No, you don't have to do anything. I was talking with the uh, confirmation kids yesterday. They had their, they had, they had their ninth grade <laughs> retreat. And part of the ninth grade retreat is that they have to come and sit in a room with me. And I get to ask them questions. And they're terrified. <laughs> and I love it. It was kind of one of those things, you know, I had to go through this. As, you know, why, why do we do this to our kids? Well, I had to go through it, so they have to too. <laughs> and I tell them, don't worry, don't worry. It's going to be okay. If you don't pass, it's just four more years of confirmation. <laughs> And one of the things we like to have them do is to be able to have some sort of working knowledge of those basic tenets of our faith, like the Apostles' Creed, like the Lord's Prayer, like the Ten Commandments. We like them to at least have some knowledge of, of what, what do we mean when we say a sacrament? What do we mean when we say that we are simultaneously saint and sinner? First, first Latin I ever learned in seminary. I mean, I think it was in the first week we learned in our theology class, the Latin simul ustus epicator simultaneously saint and sinner. We are both at the same time. We are neither one or the other. We are always. And so I asked them, what does it mean that we are saint and sinner? And every student pretty much said the same thing, even though they had been taught something completely different. And I know why. They had been taught, and I know this because I taught the class, that we do not make ourselves saints. We don't strive for sainthood. It's not because of the things that we do that are right and good in the eyes of God that we are rewarded with this moniker, saint. But every one of the students said, well, when you do good stuff, you're a saint. And so I said, when you do bad stuff, you're a sinner, right? So it all has to do with what you do. Yes. No. And I took the opportunity again to remind them that we are not, we don't make ourselves saints. We are made saints by God. God makes us a saint. Well, when does God do that, Pastor? On the cross. On the cross, God rewards all of creation with the title saint. Now, that doesn't undo that part of our lives where we still uh, are you know, thinking of ourselves and we're still con our, our, relations are, our relationships are still conditional. That's the sinner part. The part of if I have a relationship with you, there is a part of me that keeps asking the question, what's in this for me? No matter what relationship it is. Pastoral relationship, I am your pastor. But still, I, on, on, on the 20th of every month, I want to see my paycheck go into my bank account, right? The relationship is still, there's a conditionality to it at its best. So there's nothing we can do that will make us a saint. Because at my best, I'm still broken. So God isn't going to require that I make myself a saint. God is just going to make me one. Boop, you're a saint. And we spend the rest of our lives struggling with that because we just can't accept that there's no strings attached. We can't accept that there's not a price to pay on the other end. We keep waiting for the other shoe to drop, and it never does. And there is no part, here's the, here's the really good news. There is no part of that sinner in us that can ever unmake our saintness, our saintliness, our sainthood. We can't unmake that. We can't negate it. We can't nullify it because what God makes is really out of our control. I don't have the power to undo what God has done. 
I can't unmake creation. I can't just snap my fingers like, you know, Thanos and make half creation disappear. It just doesn't happen that way. Why? Because God made it and it's God's property. That's why I don't believe in demon possession. This has nothing to do with anything. But how can, how can Satan possess something that belongs to God? God bought and paid for each, every, all of creation, all of it, on the cross. It is God's property. How can, how can Satan come up and take something that belongs to God? Can't be done. So that's why I don't believe in demon possession. Even though I like The Exorcist, it's a scary movie. So the one thing I wanted the confirmation students to, to take away in our time together and I stole it, lock, stock, and barrel from Pastor Rich. I said, I always want you to remember that God will never love you less than God loves you right now, no matter what. Your sainthood has been bought and paid for. Your sainthood has been declared by God. Declared by God. And if we can bet the farm on anything, we can bet it on what God says. God said, let there be light, there was light. God said, let there be creation, there was creation. God said that Christ will come, Christ came. God said that the grave will not have the final word, the grave doesn't have the final word. God says to you today, you are a saint. You are blessed, you are part of the family, and there's nothing that you can do or anything else in all of creation can do that can nullify that reality. So the last thing I said to the confirmands is, here's what I want. Here's my prayer. Here's my prayer for every person who ever goes through confirmation. Don't live your lives from this point forward trying to earn the title saint. Don't order your life trying to get God to call you a saint. But do everything you do in your life knowing that you are already a saint. Live your life because you're a saint, not trying to become one. Let's pray. Strengthen, O oh God, the witness of your church in all the corners of the world. Make us visible signs of your grace so that others would see your goodness and come to believe in you. Breathe your, breathe your life and your peace into all creation. Protect homes, fields, and communities from damaging winds or floods. Be with our brothers and sisters in Palo Alto who have experienced an awful tragedy. And be with all. Be with all today who are struggling, struggling with issues and problems that we can't even imagine what they might be. Help us, God, to be a loving presence in the world today, rejecting the call to explain, only embracing. By the resurrection of the wounded Christ, draw us near to all those who are wounded in our midst, in mind, body, or spirit. Liberate all who are bound by grief, abuse, addiction, or pain, and restore to faith those who are despairing. We pray for those known to us to be in need of your care, God. Those on our prayer list, those names that circulate our prayer chain, we lift before you and ask your mighty presence with them, with all who are looking to hospitalizations or surgeries or procedures, all who are at home recovering from, from something or injury. We pray, God, that you would be with them through us in ways that bring healing and, and hope and peace. And for whom do the people of God pray this day, you may lift their names in the silence of your hearts, or you may speak their names out loud.
protect and provide for all whom you send out in mission across the world. Empower those who proclaim your gospel and provide them with all the physical and spiritual needs that they require to accomplish your mission in the world. As always, God, we give you thanks for all of the saints who believed in you and who now enjoy eternity with you. Sustain us with your everlasting presence and their proclamation. For you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We commend these and all of our prayers to you, O God. Come near to us with your saving help. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and Lord, who has taught us to pray as we say from our hearts, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able as we all receive our blessing for the journey today. Almighty God, who fills creation with all abundance, Jesus Christ, who spreads his arms in complete forgiveness. Holy Spirit, who draws us ever nearer and nearer to God, bless us and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. You guys can stay standing as we sing our final song.
peace. We were lost, but now we're found. We were blind, and now we see. Go in peace and love of God, proclaiming the great and marvelous things that God has done. Thanks be to God.